nowadays I have students in many places. It's, it's a kind of some strange feeling. <laughs> but so, and thank you very much, Nara Figueiredo, also, and Leonardo Sertorio and Alexandre for taking and for having me here. I, I have many friends here, and so today uh, I will speak something I, I am working on some time right now, for some time, and uh, it has to do, uh, I, what I want is linking, I am linking semantic philosophical problems to some uh, neurological findings from last from the last decades. So uh, not everyone is doing that. <laughs> it's a few people are doing that, and it's hard to to find uh, a dialogue with other science. It's all, always uh, something challenging, and uh, I am not. Uh, everywhere, um, not everywhere, people understand what I'm doing. So, but I, I am, I'm doing. <laughs> so, in um, so today, yes. Present. 
subjects react differently neurologically according to which kind of sentence they are reading, sentences containing expressions of mental states and processes, or sentences containing exclusively concepts that describe external states of affairs, relations between objects or properties of objects. This is very broad, uh, but external uh, properties, properties could be also uh, behaviors, processes, and so on.
So it's for us, it is important to think if it is necessary to suppose a kind of correlation between propositional attitudes and internal neurological states, not merely phenomenological, describable by neuroscientific concepts. So obviously, I am trying to, to find out if there is a correlation based on findings, but also I am trying to see in which sense there isn't a correlation. Uh, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex was identified by developmental neuroscience as the brain region responsible for mentalizing, that is, for considering the internal mental states of others in certain observed contexts of action. Decrease in this kind of activation occurs when the focus changes to externally focused processes that do not require considerations of a target's internal states. Several scientific findings are consistent with the internal-external distinction observed in the theory of mind research uh, as this region, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, was associated with encoding the psychological traits of, tar of a target internal, whereas the, superior, uh, the posterior superior temporal sulcus and the temporal poles were activated uh, more, uh, more activated in response to descriptions of observable behavior, that is, external. So this is a kind of network of mental This is the network uh, of mentalizing. Then we, we have more activation in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Here. Here. And also on the temporal junction here and uh, anterior temporal lobe, here. We have also activation in some other areas, uh, inferior frontal gyrus here, but uh, obviously these are the main regions that are, are activated during mentalizing. Obviously, they are not just these regions, but they, these are the main regions activated. And this is, the region uh, mostly activated during uh, when we are thinking about observable behavior. Oh, that, that means external to us. And this is the posterior superior temporal solus here. So, what we need to answer the question if there is a correlation between propositional attitudes like I desire to do that or something like that uh, to, make, to neurological activation we need to think about theories obviously about theories of, about the relation of external processes or of uh, semantic uh, speech acts and uh, neurological activations. You see, when the scientists are doing uh, research, they, they are thinking uh, of speech acts as kind of actions, as pragma pragmatists did. So, uh, I am always worried not just about the correlation between behavior and neurological activation, but also between speech acts and neurological activations. So, but recently we have a new, new theories about neurological activations and correlations that is uh, the theories called theories about, uh, of embodied cognition theories. So, these theories um, they permit us to have a new vision, a new approach to the correlation between um, pro 
processes between semantic speech acts and neurological activations. So what is important uh, for these new theories is what we call the modern simulation. And there is a group of researchers uh, uh, around Osterwick, uh, Susanne Osterwick, that are doing very interesting experiments uh, with speech acts that contain uh, mental events, words, expressions. And this uh, kind, uh, these experiments, they show something new that Matthew Lieberman wasn't considering in his papers. So therefore, I, I find what she's doing and her group is doing very interesting. Part of the group is in Europe, part of the group is in the United States. So as explicitly stated, Osterwick based their questions, uh, Osterwick and, and, and Ali, Based their questions and hypotheses on views about embodied simulation routines as interpreted by situated cognition approaches. Galesia, who was linked embodied, who has linked embodied cognition approaches to neuroscientific investigations of mirror neurons, emphasizes that the intersubjective space relies on a specific functional mechanism which is probably also a basic feature of how our brain-body system models its interactions with the world, embodied simulation. So I, I find this notion, it's not, uh, it has uh, uh, some uh, more than two decades, more than one decade now, but very, very interesting to understand human beings, to understand speech acts, and also to refute um, the kind of semantic theories in philosophy that think that we, when we understand a sentence, we understand a proposition. So I think embodied simulation uh, refutes that kind of a pro philosophical approach. Embodied cognition approaches, even if they can help in investigating verbal communication, as Garcia and Ibano show, hold that there is a biophysiological common ground that enables human beings to understand others' mental states without conceptualizing about them. This common ground has as one of its main parts, according to Galese, the capacity of simulating not only the actions of others, but also the mental states of others in an immediate and automatic way by unconscious and pre-reflexive simulation processes, embodied simulation, without the intervention of rational and inferrational thought. If there is a ground mechanism, as Galezi says, that enables the understanding of others' actions and mental states without occurrence of mental meta representations of a propositional nature, as many narrow scientific experiments are confirming, then it is possible to accept that neuroscience can help to explain the role of mental states and of understanding mental states in intersubjective interactions without needing to presuppose explicit linguistic reference to them. This is a great step toward explaining the nature of intersubjective understanding of mental states without, this is uh, repetition, cognitivist and referentialist presuppositions of necessary conditions for a precise reference of mental expressions in meaningful propositions that express knowledge about mental states. So here, I have many quotes from uh, papers, uh, Galera's papers, that uh, say uh, the same. They say that we don't need um, uh, to represent in a proposition 
transitional format met, uh, others' mind mental states so as to know what's happening in other minds. So we re react as probably other animals react, as chimpanzees and gorillas and so on, and maybe dogs and cats also. We react in a very natural way when we understand other minds' uh, thoughts, feelings, phenomenal experiences, so we embody, we simulate in our body what other people are thinking and feeling or sensing. And we don't need previously to understand propositionally what is happening in others' minds as rationalism presupposes. So our knowledge of other minds is first uh, embodied knowledge, not a propositional knowledge. So descriptions of our own and other mental states and correlated neurological activities. So what is neuroscience uh, telling us about uh, this kind of uh, assumptions. So the, this is one of this is one of Susan Osterbeek paper with uh, some of her colleagues. Concepts in context. Processing mental state concepts with internal or external focus involves different neural systems. This is from 2015. Um, in this paper, uh, Susan uh, says that according to embodied cognition theories, concepts are contextually situated and grounded in neural systems um, that produce experiential states. This view predicts that processing mental state concepts recruits neural regions associated with different aspects of experience depending on the context in which people understand the concept. So, Suzanne is still speaking about concepts and she says that she doesn't want to uh, be, uh, to, to get rid uh, of uh, the, 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 the notion of concepts, but at the same time, uh, she's challenging uh, our presupposition that we can locate concepts in the brain. That is a recently very common affair that people try to locate concepts in the brain. There are maps of uh, concepts in the brain, linguistic maps of we, where our concepts are in the brain, where they activated the brain. So she's challenging this view that is called localizationism. So when she says that uh, the test uh, she's doing um, using a set of sentences that describe emotional, emotional and non-emotional mental states with internal focus or external focus can show us that she's right, that there is not a precise activation that correlates to a precise mental state words, word. So uh, these are some sentences they, they use in the tests, for example, her mouth went by with fear, she was lost in thought, and these two sentences, uh, they call internal sentences that describe mental states, but with a focus on, on interceptive sensation, feelings, and introspections. And these other sentences here, his chest swelled with pride, she shook her head in doubt. These are called external sentences describing
described and they describe mental states which are focused on actions and expressions. So these were, were the kind of sentences they use in the tests and they use the crime uh, uh, to test uh, people's reaction and they presented 80 mental state sentences, 20 of each category, and 80 non-mental state sentences in two rounds. This is the basic of the test they, they did. And what were the conclusions? So here they show, for example, what, what they say is that they found um, Uh, more difference in activation of the brain between sentences that describe internal emotional states and sentences that describe external non-emotional states. This, they say this, kind, this activation is uh, the more strong uh, difference between internal and external uh, sentences. So what, what does this say? Uh, this, uh, the conclusion they, they drop of it is that this study provides evidence for a flexible representation of mental state concepts. Our findings indicate that different patterns of brain activation can represent the same mental state concepts depending on the focus provided by the surrounding linguistic concept, context. These findings are consistent with embodied cognition proposals that argue that simulations are multimodal and dynamic and depend on the situational context in which a mental state or any other category is processed. What is it? So what they found is that the activations, uh, the brain activations during the reading of the sentences were, weren't so different. So the main difference was between sentences that contained mental state words and sentences that didn't contain mental state words and were had an external focus. So this was the main difference. But between other sentences with uh, mental states, words with internal or external focuses, there weren't so much brain activation differences. Um, and so the conclusion were that, that the con one, one of the conclusions was that um, the mental states, for example, disgust, uh, the word disgust, with an internal focus, she's sick, or with an external focus, knows, they, they aren't so different when we think about neurological activations. And the conclusion is that they activate the, the conceptual activations depend uh, on the, the circumstances, on the situation, but at the same time they are similar. So they differ a little bit, but they are similar. This is the conclusion. They are not the same, it's not the same activation. So we can say that every, every sentence that includes the word disgust activates the brain in the same manner. We can say that. But we can, and we can say at the same time that the, the activations vary because the context, semantical context vary. So, but at the same time, it's the same mental state word that is in the sentence. 
and this was uh, for, for them and I, for me something very interesting and you related to the literature. So here just uh, activation, the difference of activations when emotional words were present or and when non-emotional words uh, were present. they summarize uh, their findings. The re this result suggests that mental state concepts as disgust, anger, doubt, or hunger are represented in a dynamic way using context relevant interoceptive and sensory motor resources. In our paradigm, However, different involvement of regions in the mirror system and mentalizing system was solely directed by internal or external focus while holding instructions constant. Given this, our studies support not only the idea that mental state concepts are embodied, but also the idea that the brain represents other people's minds in a flexible fashion depending on the information available in the situational context. So, uh, some co philosophical conclusions. <coughs> so, when neuroscientific findings show that there are flexible neural ways to simulate others' feelings, beliefs, intentions, and thoughts, this at least means that these folk psychological concepts present in propositional attitudes that describe speech acts are as complex in their meanings as are the many situations in which they are used. It also means that they do not just refer to internal states, but also include external actions as part of what they mean, of what people take them to mean when they are, they are used in utterances. That would, I believe, corroborate the pragmatic stance of speech act theories. Utterances aren't just vehicles of information, that include information about different kinds of internal intentions describable by propositional attitudes that would have neurological correlates. Uh, so when you look at the 20th century discussion about propositional attitudes that started uh, with Frege before, before the 20th century and look at these findings, I think we can say that philosophers are mostly, were mostly wrong about the reference and the meanings of propositional attitudes. In the sense that philosophers use the Propositional attitudes as common sense or common sense uses it, or Fox psychological uh, vocabulary uses it. But we must change our view of mental states, expressions, and how they are used in proposition in sentences that we call propositional attitude sentences. We must think that. Uh, we don't know when the activations in the brain, I think they can tell us something about it. Because when the activations are dynamic, are flexible, are they change according to the sentence we hear or read or to the context the sentence is describing, we can say that we can't locate precisely the activation that 
correlate to uh, mental state words. And I would conclude that this maybe this doesn't prove, but this uh, is uh, evidence for Quine's view that propositional attitudes haven't a precise reference in our mind. That would be it. Oh, okay. I have no more. I thought it. So, yes, that, that would be what I said. And many things.
uh, based on theories of embodied cognition and so forth. I think meaning isn't in the mind, isn't in the head, and, but meaning is also not in the object. So meaning is something that happens in a process, and the process in, involves uh, body, brain, and all situation, and other minds and other brains and so on. So uh, I would say that we can't locate where meaning is. Meaning is something that happens during uh, interactions of uh, persons in, that have bodies and so on. Is, is this a too, too skeptical? <laughs> <laughs> no, no but I, I like the, 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 those scouts are quite uh -huh. clear for including a sentence meaningful. reference doesn't give us a precise meaning. If, if I can uh, demarcate meaningful and non-meaningful sentences, I think I can, but we must have pragmatic uh, criteria. The, do people understand what we are saying? Uh, is it useful what we are saying? Do pe can people react to what we are saying? And so I think pragmatic criteria are very uh, important and obviously we do reference in some sense always. But as Quine says, there isn't a pre uh, determinate reference to objects. Hi, uh, thank you, Sophia. That was very informative, very clear. But I, I don't know if I caught something wrong, but I think there is a... Uh, sort of underdetermination, a empirical underdetermination issue here because it seems to me that the findings you, you brought, they show one of two things at least. Either that what we usually describe as propositional attitudes are not actually propositional attitudes, they involve some, something else, something embodied, which is I think most of your talk was in that direction. Or that concepts are not as usually philosophers suppose that concepts are, they are contest bound, contest sensitive, if you will. And these, I think, are two different philosophical, I, I'm not sure if they are two different philosophical theses, but I think they may have different yes, implications, you see, and I'm not sure what, what, uh, yes. what's your point. I understand that, because uh, I have some um, steps here that uh, I didn't uh, did, uh, I didn't did. <laughs> so some steps I didn't show here because I I am developing this for some time. I started thinking about Quine, Davidson, Wittgenstein, and so on. And then I realized that if I want to discuss that with neuroscientists, I shouldn't speak so much about the tradition, the semantic tradition. But at the same time, I understand that I should try to separate the structure of propositional attitude from sentences that contain mental state uh, words. Some new, many neuroscientists don't do that. They don't separate. When they are speaking about propositional attitudes, they are speaking about uh, mental state concepts at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, I'm, not, I'm still not sure how to do that. Yeah, okay. Be because of the literature I am uh, using. 
I'll think, I'll have to think more about that too. Yeah, but but it's it's interesting that what some, something it's very interesting when we read in our scientific papers because they are not so worried with some dis philosophical distinctions we do and we are proud of. Uh, and uh, but but I think maybe we can we can try to to discuss this literature using some more more precise uh, distinctions, semantic distinctions. Okay, uh, we have to change the card in five minutes if you want to ask the question and then in case you don't switch the table. Yeah. I, I can uh, ask the uh, question under five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but actually it would be two questions. We have one is about the uh, philosophical tradition you talked about because yeah. some things you mentioned when you for example said that um, meanings are not in our minds and so on. A little reminded me of uh, semantic externalism and externalism yes. about mental content. I wanted to ask you about your stance towards that tradition that we find in Kripke and Putnam yes. and, um, and Tyler Birch and so on. And uh, the second thing would be a rather provocative critical remark about the conclusion you draw at the end because you said those findings from neuroscience and uh, the approach of embodied cognition, they suggest that uh, the philosophers in the semantic tradition in the 20th century were just completely wrong about propositional attitudes, or were wrong about propositional attitudes and how they work, about uh, what is their meaning and what is their reference. But the thing is, as far as I know, I'm not aware of any philosopher who ever claimed that the reference or the meaning of propositional attitude words are neurological activation patterns or something like that. So my question would be, how do you draw that conclusion from findings about neurological patterns, about philosophical theories, about meaning and reference? I think there is a big gap here. And I would ask you to bridge that. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. Uh, the first question was about uh, the semantic 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 yeah. Externalist in, in many senses because I think uh, me if there is reference and if we understand uh, what something a word means, uh, we must rely on on external objects or processes. So, but what in what sense I disagree? I disagree that this kind of externalism. Entails, entails that after reference we have the meaning in the end. Because in some sense externalism sustains also something uh, that internalists sustain, that the meaning after reference we have the meaning in the end. No? I, I would disagree, but uh, I mean that's, that's, that's something to discuss. Okay, we can discuss. In the, in the sense, um, is, uh, water, for example, water, after knowing what water is, we know what water is, in the sense that there is uh, a knowledge that is internal. Yeah, but the thing is that knowledge will never uh, refine water or fix the reference to water, right? In that sense, meaning is just not in the head, as what um, would it? Yes. But, Can but I mean, that? maybe, maybe uh, to to elaborate on the question or to focus the yes. question a little more. My question would be um, about your stance towards uh, externalism and um, the combination with the embodied occurrence, because I'm not sure how well they go together. Yes, yes. Uh, this I think this is uh, the kind of philosophical uh, stance that uh, I would say is very common in the sense that. It's very difficult for philosophers to see the link, the bridge between neurological activations and what they are discussing. It's strange for me. It isn't, it isn't uh, difficult in the sense that um, when I speak a 
about reference, when I speak about meanings, I think they must, uh, the, the head, the, the, the brain and the body, they must be part of this process. And not just what you maybe call mind or rational inferences and so on. Um, because I am really a monist in the sense that I think every mental uh, state has a brain correlate. And so I think the discussion, I have, I have been also writing on the difference uh, on the more radical naturalism, for example, of Ruth Millikan and other kinds of naturalisms, for example, from Macau or something that are very different. <laughs> but they call it also naturalism. I, I, I would say that I think, from my point of view, that is very naturalistic, but, uh, very strongly naturalistic, that we should always try to take into account evolutionary um, biology so as to answer any kind of philosophical question. And also questions about meaning and reference. So I understand that, that it, 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 it's kind of strange for the philosophical tradition to do that in semantics. Because uh, maybe what people, I think, are, are doing is they think language is part of our second na nature and not of our primary nature. And therefore, what happens with body and brain shouldn't be so relevant to explain uh, meaning. But as a materialist, I am naturalist and mater materialist, I would like to have a explanation that is uh, is not like that that is a, a explanation that includes uh, neurological findings and biological findings and evolutionary biology so, so you would say the philosophical project to pursue is naturalization of semantics then uh, yes yes oh, yes <laughs> yes I have written about it in in some papers, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned uh, Lars Larson, your presentation. Ah, yes. yes, I'm uh, trying to study uh, some papers uh, of Lars uh, And uh, I was wondering if you accept this framework entirely the multi model uh, concept framework entirely. Because uh, uh, Barcelou uh, 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 has famously uh, uh, insisted on the thesis that concepts are simulators and that uh, we cannot uh, access uh, one concept uh, once uh, at all. We cannot do it. Yeah, it is a, you know, like a big storage, uh, and we just uh, select some uh, uh, aspects in order to use uh, this concept in some situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you agree with this uh, framework and if you are using this uh, without problem. Some years ago, we we start we studied uh, Jesse Green's book uh, from. 2002, where he, he really uses Pasalou's view on concepts and tries to apply it, and at the same time, he, uh, Jesse Prince uh, tried to improve it in the same sense that he, he has in mind a theory of concepts, even if we have a net of neuro, neurological activation where we can't really see where a concept is and so on, um, we would have a theory 
about how, what is happening when we use a concept, and when we identify an object of a, a, a category, or when we re-identify an object of a category, for example, bird or monkey or something. Um, the, the thing is, even in body cognition theorists, and I think Barsalou and also Oscar Dick and so on, they don't say we should get rid of concepts and the notion of concepts. They, they are saying we can't locate activations of a a, a one concept in one area of the brain. So it's, uh, the thing is, uh, the activations are multiple, multiple, amodal or multimodal, in the sense that there is not just one area that uh, think about birds or think about living beings or think about uh, humans. Uh, so it's, uh, Sometimes the whole brain is activated when we understand a concept. So this is linked to memory also, how, how we memorize uh, categories of objects. Uh, I, I would agree with Basel in the sense that we use many senses to understand uh, a category of objects, so it's multimodal. And at the same time, but we must be able to recognize another human when we see it or there. So uh, we use we use categories. We need categories, but we can't say that the categories are defined in the sense that they are. They have a complete definition or, or, a, or a, a precise correlate of neural activations. Is the question? So we 
use language, obviously. And, uh, but the modern cognition uh, approach shows us that we are flexible even with, when we understand language and when we understand mental concepts. Even then, we are we embody it because I think the, the thing is uh, the basic the ba when we learn when we learn what other minds are doing when we learn it the first thing we do is embody we embody it and then we can express it express it so a baby can embody the, the feelings of the mother obviously but when when the baby learns language with one year two years three years it starts to express these feelings and this embodiment we all do it so we, we must take that, that into consideration when we speak about uh, knowing what other people are 